I think one of the great underappreciated divides in our country today is not that between Republicans and Democrats, but between the managerial class and the everyday citizen. And it is a managerial class that isn't just limited to government, permeates every other institution, now increasingly in private sector life in America as well. And they're the stewards of institutions that often co-opt that institution's workings for their own gain. I'm focused on that in the federal government. You know, talk a lot about the fourth branch of government, the administrative state, which I intend to dismantle. We have three branches of government, the United States, executive, legislative, and judicial. There's no fourth codified in the Constitution the last time I read it. It's that fourth branch that actually operates with the greatest power today. But this is just a symptom of a deeper cultural trend in America where the managerial bureaucrats have gained far more control of every institution, our universities, increasingly our companies, nonprofit institutions, and yes, government too, that I think reveals a deeper skepticism of individuals and the ability of individuals to not only govern themselves in a constitutional republic, but to come together in any institution to realize its purpose without being intermediated by the actual managers who are entrusted with safeguarding that institution. Sort of reminds me of a story I uh, first read in high school. It was Dostoevsky's The Grand Inquisitor. That was the chapter out of the Brothers Karamazov, one of his great works. And the way the parable went was Christ came back to earth in the middle of the Spanish Inquisition. And he was spotted on the street performing miracles. And then the Grand Inquisitor of the church heard about this and when he was spotted on the street, he had Christ arrested. And the peak of the chapter is the dialogue between the Grand Inquisitor and Christ in that prison cell, where the Grand Inquisitor tells Christ that we, the church, don't need you here anymore. In fact, your presence here impedes our work. And he sentences Christ to execution the next morning. What do I mean when I'm talking about the managerial class? I'm talking about the Grand Inquisitor the one that Dostoevsky wrote about in The Grand Inquisitor. And so anyway, that's the conversation we're going to have today about the rise of the managerial class and maybe a little bit weaved in there about crushing not only the will of the everyday citizen, but if we have time for it, a little bit of the discussion about the suppression of wage growth in America as well and what's going on there. These things are all related. And I'm happy to say I probably have like, you know, probably the best person in the country to talk about this unique nexus of issues. I know this because I've read some of his work. I quoted it in my first book, Woke Inc., uh, he's not a political partisan by any stretch, but he's an intellectual, somebody whose work I've enjoyed. I've been looking forward to meeting for a long time and have a chance to meet today. So Michael Lind, it's good to meet you. Welcome to the podcast. And I've been looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for having me. So I want to talk about not your most recent book yet, though, if we have time, we'll get there. But the one before, the rise of the managerial class that I talked about that is in deep tension, in deep form of almost cultural warfare with the everyday citizens and or individual constituents of institutions they're supposed to represent. You've written extensively about this. Why don't you get some of your views on the table? And and you know, in some ways, you came before me. Woke Inc. was written after you wrote your book. So I think you get to go first here. Tell me about the, about the perspective. The new class war, saving democracy from the managerial elite. I build on the mid-century American thinker, uh, James Burnham's idea that uh, a new class of managers, not only in big corporations and banks, but also in bureaucratized nonprofits and in government agencies, was replacing the, uh, the capitalists of the uh, 19th century, the owner operators, the so-called bourgeoisie of Marxist theory. Uh, Burnham had started off as a, a disciple of uh, Leon Trotsky, but he concluded that Trotsky was wrong, the, uh, the old-fashioned capitalists were indeed giving way, but to a new group of bureaucrats, both public and private, not to the working class, not to the proletariat. Uh, and over time, Burnham, uh, his views moved to the right. He became a founder of National Review with his friend uh, William F. Buckley Jr., one of my mentors when I was young. Uh, so, But his, his essential analysis, I think, was correct. Uh, and there have been others, including Milovan Gilas, great Yugoslav communist uh, dissident, who talked about the new class 
Um, the liberal economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, talked about the technostructure. But what all of them were saying was that uh, in modern societies, you get the bureaucratization of what were fairly small scale, intimate organizations in, in the 19th century, in the 18th century. Uh, so the company goes from being a small company with the owner operator capitalist running it to this massive bureaucratic organization where in some cases, ever fluctuating shareholdership makes ownership uh, impossible to identify. Uh, the same thing happens in the 20th century with gigantic bureaucratic philanthropy like the Ford Foundation uh, or Rockefeller or these other enormous foundations where the donors don't control them. In many cases, they're long dead. It's, it's simply a self-perpetuating group of bureaucrats, the bureaucratization of the university, and so on and so on and so on. So when, if Burnham is correct, the contemporary Marxists who say you have two classes, capitalists and workers, are 100 years behind the times. They're ignoring the rise of these private and public and nonprofit bureaucracies uh, as, as a self-perpetuating oligarchy. And they ha it, it's actually becoming an aristocracy because uh, you have to have university credentials to participate uh, in, in these public and private nonprofit bureaucracies. And the best prediction of whether you will graduate with a bachelor's degree is whether you had one or more parents who did so already. So, so we have these two things going on. One is the centralization of social power, government, uh, the culture, uh, and the economy in very centralized bureaucratic organizations. Uh, and the other is the use of university educations to screen out uh, uh, potential uh, people in these organizations. So it's interesting that you focus on that axis more than wealth, actually. Um, and that's where the departure is maybe from the classical Marxist to look at green pieces of paper, whereas you're looking at sort of the new currencies, I guess if you could call it that, to wield power in a way that a Marxist in some ways ought to be worried about if they were really solving for the real thing. Well, well, that that's actually the the Marxist criticism of my views uh, and of this Burnhamite approach to the managerial elite in general has been, oh, well, the capitalists are still in control. The managers are merely their employees. Well, in, with a lot of corporations, that makes no sense because you have thousands of dispersed shareholders and uh -huh. they may be changing day to day. So the CEO really is in charge, right? You know, it's it's not the fluctuating shareholders. Uh, moreover, in, in American law, and the same is true in European and Asian, the, the, the shareholders do not really own the corporation. This is a myth that was spread by Milton Friedman, the economist who was not a lawyer. Uh, if I own shares of a corporation, even if I own majority shares, I can't just go in and fire the uh, uh, secretary, right? I can't make all of, you have to go through all of these legal procedures, you know, with the CEO and the board of directors and all of that. So my answer to the Marxists is let's have a thought experiment. All of the rich people in the U.S., the, the capitalists, people who live off of investments, they vanish tomorrow. Society more or less continues to function because most of the managers are salaried employees. They may own shares, but they have they're very well paid salaried professionals. Now, let's do the opposite thought experiment. Suppose that all of the CEOs, all of the staffers, all of the foundation program officers, all of the university administrators just vanish overnight, but the capitalists and the working class remain. Our society would disintegrate. The basis of power in the United States and in Western Europe and in Japan and so on uh, is not money directly. It is a position of power in a powerful bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, you know, if you're the chair of Goldman Sachs, you may not be the richest person in the world, but you have vastly more power and influence, right, than like a Walmart heir or heiress. Totally. Totally right. It's a good analogy. So, so how do you define, I mean, I think you and I know both know it from habituation and experience, but is there like a def definition that you would offer of the member of the managerial class? What does that mean? Well, the, the closest uh, and, and the, the test that I use in my book, The New Class War, uh, is a college education. 
because about a third of the, the country has a college, uh, at least a BA now. The real serious managerial class at this point, you need a, a PhD or an MBA, a graduate degree of some kind. Uh, and as I said, these are not because of your skills, it's because these are screening devices. Uh, but so the comparison, and I'm showing my age as an old cold warrior, uh, in all the communist countries, you have what is called a nomenclatura. These are the party members. Now, there are millions of them in the country. They're a minority. They're less than 10% in, in the old Soviet Union in, in modern China. What do you call them? The, the oh, nomenclatura. The nomenclature. From nomenclature. From okay, nomenclature. the nomenclatura. Got it. Got yeah, it. and it actually it literally meant the nomenclature. They were the list of names from whom officers could be chosen. Now, the vast majority of the communist nomenclatura of the party members were not terribly powerful. You know, they weren't terribly wealthy. You know, they had, they were like the you know junior commissar in Kazakhstan or whatever. And if you looked at them, they weren't necessarily vastly well-to-do compared to the non, non-elite in the Soviet Union. But the, the Politburo, the, the actual small elite that's governing things, could only be chosen from their ranks. So, so there's George Orwell in uh, uh, 1984, he has the outer party and the inner party. So the outer party is a minority of the population, and most of them are not terribly powerful. But they have perks that the the proletarians don't have. The inner party are the people who really run, you know, the big brother system. But they are all selected from the outer party, even though they're vastly uh, uh, more powerful and, and better connected than members of the outer party. So what distinguishes our outer party from the working class uh, is basically uh, university education. Now, at what we see, as I talk about in my new book, Hell to Pay, from credential inflation, uh, the BA is being denatured. Too many people are getting BNAs and it's losing its scarcity value. Uh, and so therefore, maybe by the 2030s or 2040s, it will actually be the graduate degree. That is, the BA may become the new high school degree. Even for the outer party. Even for the outer party. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, so – Here's kind of how my sense of describing it is. I think we're describing the same thing. I, I, I even feel right now the college degree is almost over-inclusive of people who are really part of the managerial class, as, as I think you and I mean it. Um, I think about it as the, the pool of people from which anything, any entity that has a board of directors, could be a nonprofit, could be a company or whatever, could be a university. But if there's such a thing as the title of a board of directors – the people who are eligible to sit in that role constitute today's managerial class. Well, Actually, it's a somewhat narrower version, but it's an excellent version because executives are constrained by by boards, you know, legally and in, in terms of power. Oh, absolutely. And even even I mean, people like myself or or you know, I mean, you could think of certain quirky entrepreneur types, sort of cringe at like the idea of sitting on a board. It's not a particularly appealing activity. I've I've not particularly enjoyed doing it every time I've done it. So so it's not like a wealth thing, even though, you know, quirky entrepreneurs, you know, I've I've enjoyed plenty of wealth creation through the businesses I've started, et cetera. It's not, it's not quite that. You can you can be and also just because you don't have a lot of wealth doesn't mean that you can't be included in that club. In fact, you can if you come from the right sort of social standing in the world of media or academia or, you know, or, or other management roles. But I think the pool of people who would be considered eligible to sit on a board of directors, whatever that board of directors is, to me is the managerial class in America. Yeah. And C. Wright Mills, the 1950s Marxist and a fellow Texan, uh, spoke about interlocking directorates. And I think one of the reasons, and you may have seen this in your own experience, I've seen it, I've witnessed it up close, boards of directors are, are conformist forces. Oh, yeah, they are. Because you, you, know, you start bringing in people who don't, aren't, they really are not interested in your quirky entrepreneurial idea. They want your organization to win general approval of their social circle, right? And, and at minimal risk to themselves, at minimal risk to themselves, yeah. Yeah, so it has a stifling effect on innovation and on creativity, in my opinion. 
why adopt that system of governance at all, right? Our institutions were so in the West and the law sort of creates the conditions for it, but we're bound up by whatever proper governance is in an organization it has to take the form of a board of directors. It doesn't really make sense, actually, if what you're solving for is creating things that don't exist in the world and to serve people who are outside of that special club. What's your take? Well, actually, this is, this is, this is relevant to the James Burnham theory because it made sense in 1900 Why? or in 1920 because the board of directors was the rich guys who owned the Oh, sure. that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. They were the owners. But but the, but you know, U.S. Steel or whatever had gotten so big that that Carnegie could not you know manage it directly. So you hired managers. But the theory was you would have a small number of people would own all the stocks, uh, and they would you know hire and fire the managers. They were like a condo association. So it made sense already by the 1930s when uh, uh, Adolph Burley and Gardner Means write about the modern managerial corporation. The board of directors no longer really reflects people with a stake in the organization. You know, they, they may nominally be elected by shareholder elections, uh, but unless the founders, as some tech founders have done, you know, uh, keep most of the shares for themselves or have class A and class B and so on, you get this really weird anomalous thing. And you find the same thing in nonprofits, where according to law, the board of directors has all power. Even if they don't raise any of the money for the nonprofit, uh, and they were just you know some random friends of the president who got appointed years ago, so it's a very strange legal structure. And as I say, it tends to to promote conformity among elite organizations. Now, here's just an interesting question for you. Um, I guess, like, I'm not on the left, but assume it's a challenge coming from the left, which is. Why is so – suppose you're – so far what you've offered and what we've been covering so far is a descriptive account. It's not saying this is good or bad. Why is that model of power distribution worse or less desirable than one in which it was just the capitalists that were wielding the power instead? Like if you if you did – substitute in the blank and said that the thought experiment were such that all the rich people disappear and all the managerial class disappear in sequence, it would actually be the society falls apart in the case of the rich people, you know, the Ayn Rand vision of the world or whatever, the Atlas Shrugged vision of the world. Okay. Like that, that would be, that's a different worldview, but it's a different group, some overlap, but not entirely overlapping group of people who hold the, hold the keys to power. Why is that better? Oh, I, I, I think that there's no doubt that managerial capitalism in sectors where it's relevant, such as manufacturing, uh, pharmaceuticals, aerospace, automobiles, uh, in, the, in the productive economy, uh, it, it's, it's, it's far superior to old fashioned small proprietor capitalism. You can't have lots of mom and pop aerospace companies and automobile companies. You have to have massive organizations. Uh, it is better in my opinion that they be capitalist to some degree rather than simply being government bureaucracies. So, so there's a, a strain on the right that wants to use antitrust to break up everything big. Well, that's, that's the end of your country as a technological and manufacturing power uh, and also as a military power. So then the question becomes, uh, how do you check the power uh, of and we're just talking about the private economy now, okay? Because you can structure the nonprofit sector and education in much more radically different ways. But okay, so but let's say you have Ford Motor Company and you have Boeing, right? And you have uh, uh, Apple. Uh, there were historically two ways to deal with this if you rejected antitrust, breaking up Boeing into 150 little tiny mom and pop airplane companies. One is regulation. And the other is what John Kenneth Galbraith called countervailing power. So regulation assumes that you have a wise, benevolent government elite, which you know, will win an election. Maybe they're elected politicians. Maybe they're appointed uh, regulators. But they will do the right thing. They will just give orders and they will keep these giant uh, concentrations of industry, which we need, uh, in, in line, you know, focused on their work and not abusing workers and the environment and so on. 
a much more skeptical view uh, informs the idea of countervailing power, which is you can't trust massive concentrations of private power, but you also can't trust massive concentrations of public power. And and if when you're when they're the same class, when the regulators and the CEOs went to the same prep schools and the same Ivy League universities and so on, and their kids all go to the same uh, kindergartens, uh, then it's just really one elite. I mean, even though it's nominally public and private. So the countervailing power theory says ordinary people need to be able to pool their efforts to have uh, organizations, mass membership organizations uh, that can bargain on their behalf without hoping that elected officials will, you know, altruistically govern on their behalf, uh, but also give them some bargaining power with uh, with corporations. And historically in the United States and in Western Europe, the two most powerful mass membership organizations were churches and trade unions. Uh, because these were extra governmental organizations that were accountable to their members. They weren't necessarily democratic. Uh, you know, if it's, it's the Catholic Church, you don't elect the Pope. But but they you know they were they were accountable, uh, and uh, you know so what has happened and the, and the third group was local political party machines, which up to the 1970s the parties in the United States from Martin Van Buren in the 1830s onwards have been uh, federations of local chapters. They were clubs. They were clubs federations of clubs uh, that all disintegrated with the primary system in the 1970s. So. You flash forward to the 21st century, these three organizations that were not formal government organizations, but they acted as lobbies on behalf of working class people in particular who didn't have money and they didn't have social connections and they didn't have influence. Uh, the churches, the trade unions and the local political machines, they, they're largely fallen apart or, or died out. And that just means that the managerial elite can kind of do what it wants to. And we've seen that's what it's been doing for, for a couple of decades. There's nobody on the outside who's going to stop them. So, so what do you think is the solution to this? Well, I'm kind of pessimistic. I think the solution has to be to build up uh, these, these some new versions. It doesn't have to be old versions. The existing National Labor Relations Act union uh, system is dead. It, it can't be revived. Uh, you know, people are leaving churches. It's kind of hard without the religious revival to change that. But what you need is uh, reformers within the managerial elite itself, uh, and also uh, capitalists. You know, who have the resources to to be heretics. Sometimes you have to have a reform faction within the elite, and it needs to set up structures uh, that will mobilize ordinary people. And and give them power, so so you would have this reform faction of the managerial elite actually trying to empower working class people to check the authority of their fellow managerial class. You know, and this has happened throughout history. Whenever you've had the extension of the suffrage, you've had extension of civil rights. It was always led to some degree by members of the existing elite, uh, and often they did it for political reasons. You know, it wasn't just out of altruism. Uh, it was to create like new voters or to create new supporters. Uh, so I, I th I, that's how I think it happens. Otherwise, you're limited to two things. One is ordinary people can vote every couple of years and maybe they will, maybe they won't. And most Americans, as you know, live in single member, single party districts where your vote doesn't count uh, So uh, because it's not a swing district. Uh, and you can hope that the person elected in the all democratic or all republican district will do something for you but you know it's kind of a if you're working class i don't think there's much hope there uh the alternative is that you uh uh just try to persuade the managerial elite itself out of the goodness of their hearts to to try and that you know these are not bad people no no the, the, no most human yeah. beings are good by nature good people yeah the problem with oligarchies and aristocracies is they only talk to each other. Uh, a certain mayor of New York, whom I will not name, but you, you know, there aren't that many uh, possible alternatives, told me one time that he kept in touch with the, the man on the street 
by talking to his bodyguards in his limo. Okay, well, at least he was trying, right? I'm not sure how accurate a reflection they were. Uh, but but it's a problem. It's a problem, you know, uh, not to be in a bubble of other managers. It's it, it's an interesting distinction. Um, one of the observations I would make, I was just curious about recent political history is, you talked about the de decline of mass member organizations to stand up to that concentration of power. It feels like the MAGA movement is in some ways a mass member organization that filled the void created by the death of trade unions, local political party machines, churches. I mean, Trump in 2016 in particular, and Trump today is something else, but Trump in 2015 or 2016 created a sort of mass member organization that stood up to the managerial power structure. That's kind of what was baked in there. I'm curious what your reaction to that is. Well, in my book, The New Class War, I argue that you, you, it's easy to get locked into a doom loop in which you have the technocratic neoliberals with the managerial elite, uh, and they just run things most of the time and pay no attention to the public. Then you get large sections of the public get very alienated, and they look for demagogues. They look for demagogic populists. And some of them are good, some of them are bad. I'm, I'm just using this as a technical term. And we've seen this. They can be good ones. They can be good demagogues. Uh, and we've seen this in where you have very weak uh, mass membership institutions in the American South between the Civil War uh, and, the, and the Civil Rights Revolution. You got these demagogues like Huey Long, and they did some good things, you know, sometimes. Uh, in South America, you had Juan Perón in Argentina, you had uh, Vargas in Brazil, uh, and they were semi dictators, semi popular. But the problem with these uh, demagogues, and, and even when they're very well intentioned and very accomplished, uh, it tends to be an evanescent, it's not a lasting structure, it's not a lasting machine. It tends to, so it evaporates. It's a cult of personality. And when the personality is removed, the whole thing crumbles. Or, as happened with uh, Huey Long uh, and happened with uh, uh, various other demagogues, it becomes family members. So essentially, they create a family dynasty, which then joins the existing elite, the, you know, the children or the brothers or the sisters or nephews or nieces or whatever. But again, it sort of fizzles out. So so I think, you know, often the demagogues, the, if you're a successful demagogue, you are filling a void in public discourse, right? It means the voice of the people. That's what it, what it means in Greek. Uh, and so uh, Trump seized on various issues that were being excluded by the elite bipartisan consensus. Uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, who's a sort of demagogue of the left, did the same thing. Uh, and so you can you can introduce those uh, issues into general discussion, but unless there's some kind of organization that isn't just a cult of personality around one individual or one family, uh, then it's all too easy for the establishment just to wait until that person goes away. Uh, as, as the establishment is fervently praying, Trump will go away, right? Uh, and uh, as the democratic establishment uh, pretty much uh, you know, did in Bernie Sanders uh, in in 2020s by rallying everybody against him and getting uh, the the progressives to drop out of the race. Uh, so, so you know, it's like they say in Vegas: never bet against the house. Uh, if you have an outsider populist demagogue coming up against this in, interlocking bureaucracies that control, you know, much of the corporate world, banking, media, universities, and nonprofits. Well, you know, my money's going to be on the establishment. Yeah, I mean, that's as a betting man. The question is, as a normative compass, um, you know, what do we do about it? I, I think I, I think the, I think part of the ticket out is not just the creation of the mass member organizations, because that's still in this is such an interesting conversation that takes time. But I think there's even a normative current that, like, this is where I think on the descriptive account, you and I are locked in arms. I think on the normative account, um, you know, I think this is where, yeah, I don't think we're, we're in disagreement, but, but my view is a little bit orthogonal to yours, where I think that embracing the 
individuality of the individuals who occupy the members of the managerial power structures is likely our way out. And I do think that we live in a moment where, you know, we human beings, what makes us human? We're able to believe in something bigger than ourselves. We're able to embrace ideals, ideals that we all share in common. And that's what makes us different than animals. Animals respond to needs. They, you know, can't believe in things. Part of what it makes America appealing, I think, to ought to make America appealing is that it calls on our humanity. It's a nation founded on a set of ideals. And so I guess I'm wondering whether a form of nationalism that calls on the common thread of ideals that we share as individuals and spheres of our lives that go outside of the social power relation prism of viewing the world that we've sort of been talking about is is closer to being our way out of this quagmire than conceding that the relationships are governed by power relations at all. I mean, we started with the Marxist example. Now we're saying, no, no, that locus of that power relationship is, you know, in the form of bureaucratic power and managerial power, when maybe we just need to get rid of the, you know, I don't know what label you put on it, Foucault, post-Foucault, whatever, you know, uh, power structure laden view of human relations to try on a different prism that asks whether power relations are even the way we ought to be looking at this. And even though that could be a source of concern and there's truth to that account, there can be truth to a different account too that dilutes the problems of the first account to less prominence, um, if not dilutes it to irrelevant by calling on the power of our common idealism as human beings, as citizens of a nation, say, that make the that make the inequalities, be it through wealth or through bureaucratic standing, limited to such a small scope of importance that the civic equality that we all bear as citizens are actually what grounds us in a true, deeper, normative equality. And I don't know how much you followed in recent in the last week when I sort of it was a an idea that's neither here nor there for our conversation, really, but it is in a little bit of a way where I said we'd raise the voting age from eighteen to twenty five, but you still vote at age eighteen. If you either perform national service in the form of six months in the military or uh, first responder role or else pass the same civics test that an immigrant has to pass, in the sense, whether you're a kid of a billionaire, whether you're a kid of a college educated person or whether you're not, that's what determines whether as a young person you get to participate in selecting who governs the country. Anyway, I, I bring that up through this ramble. Well, you know, no, I, that, that's, that's, rel that's relevant. I. Uh... Uh, I ghost wrote much of William F. Buckley Jr.'s book on national service. Oh, really? At, I was 26, I think. Uh, so it can be done right and it can be done wrong. So the right way to do it is to make it universal and mandatory for everybody. The way that it's been often been discussed is uh, if you get student loans, if you get any kind of government aid, you have to do national service. Oh, I reject that. That's but if your parents wrong. can yeah. just write you a check. No, 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 no. Don't. It doesn't so, make any so, sense. Yeah, so, and that was that was Bill Buckley's view too. It has to be universal. It has to be universal. Uh, I mean, you, you understand the proposal that I made, which is it's a it's a much more diet version of that, but but it is universal in the sense that nobody can vote at eighteen if they don't do it, and you can vote at eighteen if you do do it, but at least has like a civic empowerment. But it's regardless, there's no buying your way out of it. Well, so here's here's the big. Uh, I know all the arguments for national service uh, for and against. So what kills it? Uh, is two things. One, organized labor tends to oppose it, saying that employers are going to use these, at least civilian national service, right? That is, if you allow people to do civilian work, like being nursing aides, then the fear is that you're not going to hire 45-year-old nursing aides with kids, right? You're going to hire 18 year Same fear of AI, except conscripts. it's being supplied yeah. by unpaid labor yeah. of a different kind, yeah. Uh, and the, the other explanation is simply that it's tyranny uh, to do this in peacetime. Now, to me, the answer really would be to do it through a militia type system, not a right wing militia, but, you know, classic, you know, colonial era, early Republican militia and just do it at the state level. But here, but I think it has to be connected to national security. And I think that in the modern world, it would be very easy to do this because uh, if there are serious direct assaults 
among great powers in the 21st century, the US, Russia, China, uh, they're going to try to shut down each other's infrastructure before they do anything else. So, so I think you could come up with things that you could do without going to serve in foreign combat that would be true national defense. Shipbuilding, uh, where we have a short, I mean, we could, we could shipyards. So, so, you know, I, I think you and I are very similar wavelengths here. Here's something I learned in this conversation is that it turns out I've quoted not one of your books, but two of your books. I just thought I was quoting Buckley, uh, which is in my in, in the same book, Woke Inc., that I wrote. It was a different part of the book. So, Well, Bill wouldn't mind. He, he was asked when, he, uh, when, when Reagan became president. They said, well, if your friend Ron Reagan becomes president, what cabinet post would you accept? And Bill said, uh, ventriloquist. <laughs> I like that. I really like that. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I think there's a role for everyone to play, right? And so that doesn't take a, that doesn't take away. Uh, well, Reagan had a great Reagan line that either. you get a lot done in politics. You get a lot done in politics if you don't care who takes the credit. Yes, yes, I, uh, I'm in for that model. I agree with you. I think that get the right person saying the right things. That any person saying the right things really doesn't. Doesn't much matter as long as we have a way of getting them done. Well, Michael, we could go on for for a long time. This is a good introductory conversation. I take it you and I are going to be chatting for some time to come. And um, you know, I'd ask you to think about a, a more real. I don't know, more realistic. Anything can be realistic, I suppose. But maybe maybe a good first step towards the service model may not. Like you, I'm I'm not for this buying your way around it because then it just doesn't work. But maybe tying it to civic privileges at least, so it's not at behest of imprisonment. But at behest of civic privileges like determining who gets to run the country, for example, uh, maybe a bridge that actually in the American context gets there in a way that, you know, in South Korea or Israel, it might work the other way. But in the American context, this might just be our way of doing it, tying the privileges of citizenship to the duties. And so that's, that's a thought I'd leave with you. Well, I think the 15th Amendment might, the, the, you'd have to revise the 15th Amendment. Oh, that's why it'd have to be done by constitutional amendment, no doubt about it. And and so, uh, but you can but you can recreate, I think something like a national service without without amendment. I got you. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, but I think the political consensus around you know tying it to civic privileges may be more attuned to the it, it immediately sidesteps the tyranny argument, which is which is the main argument. Otherwise, and a great discussion, Michael. Really enjoyed it, and uh, and and I hope this is the first of several that we have. So. Looking forward to it. Thank you. I'm Vivek Ramaswamy candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Vivek 2024.